watching the room, correct? Yes, sir. Perfect. The Lord be with you. I'm also with you. Let us pray. A prayer for joy in God's creation. O Heavenly Father, who has filled the world with beauty, open our eyes to behold your gracious hand in all thy works. That rejoicing in your whole creation, we may learn to serve you with gladness for the sake of him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm going to turn it over to Mary Bird, who's going to introduce our special speakers this evening. So Mary Bird and Ramsey. Sorry, I think. Yeah, he's here too. He's going to jump in. Um, that was a perfect prayer, Wallace. Thank you very much. Happy Earth Day, everybody. Tomorrow, as you know, April 22nd, we always celebrate Earth Day, and we thought at this time of our season that it would be fun to invite people that really care about God's creation in very intense ways. So tonight we have two, it's a powerhouse duo, Cameron Barton and Georgia Ackerman. Um, Georgia is the Apalachicola Riverkeeper and she's done lots of things in her history to get her to this point. She had her own ecotourism company She's worked for Tall Timbers in our Red Hills region, and she works with the she has worked with the Red Hills Farm Alliance to encourage local um, farming. Currently, she is the executive director of the Riverkeeper, and she's going to tell you lots about the history and the current ongoing matters that are critical to the Apalachicola River. Cameron comes to us as an educator. She is professionally a sixth grade teacher at McClay School, science teacher, and brings the river to life for her students, but she has a spiritual connection to the river. I really feel, I've seen it. She's my sister. I know that her connection is real. And um, she has been a river trek participant. She's gonna tell you what that means and how she's gonna do it again uh, to promote protection of this uh, very valuable resource in our area. So ladies, we are really thankful for your time and your presence here. And I know this is going to be a powerful presentation. You're not going to want to go far from your screen because every minute is going to be action packed. So welcome and thank you. And I'll let you guys take it away. Thank you. Thank you. And probably the one thing we didn't work out, Cam, is who wanted to share some, wanted to share their information first. What would you like to do? It doesn't matter to me. Okay. Well, how about, I think you have the really fun stuff. So how about I start with the organizational stuff and then you get them all fired up about coming and playing in the water. I think that could be a good course. Okay, right? perfect. Um, thank you for um, having me here. I'm actually setting my little timer right now because um, I want to make good use of your time. And I also want to leave lots of room for um, questions and interaction. So I'm going to share my screen. And here we go. So I'm Georgia Ackerman. I'm the Riverkeeper and Executive Director at Apalachicola Riverkeeper. So I kind of wear two hats. And if you aren't familiar with Apalachicola Riverkeeper, we're a nonprofit organization affiliated with Waterkeepers Florida and the Waterkeeper Alliance. Um, we're all 501c3s, uh, nonprofit organizations. And every Waterkeeper group in Florida is a little bit different. But as I told my kids years ago, when they asked me, well, what is a river keeper? I explained a river keeper is kind of like a Lorax because most kids and adult kids understand Dr. Seuss's character, the Lorax who speaks for the trees. River keepers speak for their waterways, which includes the land and the trees and the species and the humans and all of that dynamic life that depend on um, healthy waterways for, for survival. So, um, those are some of the groups we're affiliated with. So we're gonna play a little game. Those of you that have chat function, go ahead and just throw your answers in the chat because I believe that probably a lot of you know a lot about the Apalachicola River and Bay already. So I'm gonna throw out some softball questions at you. And if you wanna play along, just answer your questions in the chat. If you don't, that, that's cool too. So when we talk about the Apalachicola River, we talk about the ACF Rivers Basin, and that's three rivers. And if you can spell even one of those rivers correctly, you get bonus points. So try and write one of those other rivers in your chat box besides the Apalachicola. And, and Cam's a, an educator, so I guess she'll grade your spelling tonight while I'm talking. 
<laughs> so three rivers make up this system, the ACF basin, okay, the Apalachicola, the Chattahoochee, and the Flint, and you're probably aware that it's shared by three states. Raise your hand if you've been somewhere on the Apalachicola River at some point in your life. Raise your other hand if you've been to the Apalachicola Bays or St. George Sound or any of these coastal waters along here, and I bet every single person here has. And so you all know as we celebrate Earth Day that we happen to live adjacent to a really magical place. And those of you that are in the Tallahassee and the Red Hills area know that this connection of land is really important to us and needs to be protected. I'm sitting in, at, in St. George, on St. George Island right now, just so you all know, breathing the, the sea air. And this is just a, a blow up shot for you. So this green is the ACF, or excuse me, the Apalachicola subbasin. So we've got three subbasins within the, the broader basin. And what's important to know is it comprises about 15% of that system. The bulk of the ACF basin lies within the state of Georgia. Okay, this is a fun question. So here's a list of states there. The basin is about, about 20,000 square miles. Of these four choices of states, which one do you think it's closest to? Go ahead and write it in the chat, take a guess. West Virginia. West Virginia, it's, it's a bit of a, a jump. West Virginia is close, is a little over 24,000 square miles. But the point is I want you to, to understand what a big piece of land that we're talking about. Okay, it's a, a really significant system. You're probably fully aware that the Apalachicola River is the largest river in volume of flow in the state. Okay, so the Apalachicola moves more fresh water than any other state excuse me, any other river in the state. And the other um, important thing to know about that is that fresh water supports the, um, a big chunk of the Eastern Gulf of Mexico. So we've got water coming out of the Blue Ridge Mountains, traveling through Georgia, through Alabama, the Flint and the Apalachicola River come together, Lake Seminole, and that water continues out to the Gulf and um, uh, helps the uh, estuary of Apalachicola Bay and St. George Sound and all of those coastal waters into the Gulf of Mexico. Really important dynamic system. Oh, this is a trick question. Cam probably knows the answer to this one. So are there any dams on the Apalachicola River? And I'm gonna go jump back here for a minute and let you look at the map. And you're probably thinking, yes, Georgia, there is a dam and it's at Chattahoochee. And when I drive across Highway 90, I've seen it before and that's the Woodruff Dam. Um, there are, and so you're correct, there's, there's technical, well, and I should have, that was a trick question in that it should have been, are there any big federal dams? Um, the Army Corps of Engineers controls the dams. There are various, small municipal dams on both the Flint River, the Chattahoochee. There are none on the Apalachicola, um, with the exception of Woodruff Dam, which holds back the Flint and um, Chattahoochee River creating Lake Seminole. Okay, so let's jump back through here. The Apalachicola River and Bay has a lot of things that are really special about it. And here's a list of them. I won't read them at you, but if you can take a moment, these are the some of the things that um, the, the river region are recognized. Probably the big one that I would put a lot of this under the umbrella of is biodiversity. So when I get asked frequently, so what's so special? Biodiversity is one of the biggest words that um, I like to throw out at folks. And what that means is the species diversity that we have is, is large. So there are plants and animals that live in the Apalachicola um, region, if you will. I think people get tired of the word basin, um, but it, that exists nowhere else on earth, okay? So that, that's really important. This is really a special um, place. 
one of the reasons behind this thriving system is this large forested floodplain that we have. It's also Florida's largest forested floodplain. And it's a largely remote area. So that gives it some, some buffers and protection. If you think of some of the other places that are more densely populated across our state, when I talk to other river keepers across the state that are dealing with um, some of really intense pressures of development, those are some of the things that, um, while I don't think they couldn't happen here, we've been fortunate that that aren't happening here currently. Here's a few more um, kudos to the river, special designations. The man in the biosphere one is, is also related to the um, species biodiversity, okay? So the science program through the United Nations actually studies the region as part of a, a biosphere, which is in large part due to the work that the, uh, the research reserve does. And I'm sure most of you have been to um, the Apalachicola National Research Reserve. There's a fabulous visitor center um, before you get onto St. George Island and, and some really beautiful boardwalk areas and places, interactive displays and things where you can learn a lot um, about this amazing place. Okay, Cam, I know she'll get this question right, but how many miles if you jumped off the dam, don't do it, but if you jumped and swam all the way from Chattahoochee down to the Gulf of Mexico, I recommend taking a kayak or perhaps a motorboat. How many miles would you be traveling if you were able to go in a, a fairly straight line? You're looking at about 106, 107 miles from Chattahoochee down to the Gulf. And I've got like two more questions and then, then I'll um, cover a couple of other items. This is a, a fun question. The ACF River that is primarily spring fed, I'll give you a hint. It's not the Apalachicola, though we have springs um, both on the Chipola River and the Apalachicola, but one of the rivers um, is spring fed and it's the river that is primarily an agricultural landscape. One of the bread baskets of the Southeast. It's the Flint River. Yay, Wallace got it right. You had a 50-50 chance, so good job. The, the Chattahoochee River is what's called a, a flashy river. It's, there's a lot of rock and it comes out of the mountains. So the way that river behaves is, is different, whereas the Flint is primarily um, spring fed. So just those of you that are interested in, in those type of things. I spent some time um, in prison in Albany. I mean, I was a priest in Albany. Right, right. <laughs> Um, so the largest tributary to the Apalachicola on the Florida side, you could technically say, you could argue that the Chattahoochee and Flint were tributaries to the Apalachicola, sort of. Um, but on the Florida side, what river is this right here? I'll give you a hint, a big chunk of it's in Jackson County. Do y'all know what that river is? If you do put it in the chat box, or you can go, I don't mind if y'all are off mute talking to me. I should have said that way back when, but um, it's it's more fun that way too. But whatever. whatever. Mary Bird, you should know this. Yeah. Is it what, what river is this right here? I'll give you, I'll give you a hint. Plotting? If no, it's if you grew up in the area, odds are you went tubing down this river on some miserably hot day in, in yes. July or August. It's a technique. <laughs> That's out there. Yes, you got it. It's the Chipola. Chipola River. The Chipola River is a is a fairly agricultural basin too, and it is a river that struggles with water quality issues. We've got a lot of runoff and things that go on. Whenever you deal with ag, you got to look at water quality and, and how we're protecting water and making sure that we're controlling runoff. So um, if this was a true or false question, you are probably aware that there's been various legal battles. The um, Florida versus Georgia Supreme Court case has been in, in the news a lot. When we, when we just recently got a disappointing decision. There have been that case was kind of a culmination of, of many lawsuits between the different states at various levels. When Florida filed suit, if you file suit against another state, it immediately goes to the Supreme Court. So um, we're actually looking at over 30 years of, of litigation. We have struggled to share the water fairly and with the Apalachicola literally being at the end of the line, um, the state of Georgia has um, kind of the legal upper hand in terms of, of how that water comes down. A bonus question, who controls the water of the ACFS? 
you want to put that in the chat box or just call it out too. That that works. Any guesses? I'll go back. What do you mean by who controls who controls yeah. the water? Who controls the five federal dams that are says the Corps of Engineers? Correct. So the Army Corps of Engineers controls when and how and how much and what duration of time, the flow regime, if you will, the water that makes its way down the Apalachicola River. So this is the bonus bonus question and then our, our silly trivia is over. Who controls the Army Corps of Engineers? Any guesses? There's no prizes, so it's okay if you get something wrong. <laughs> Congress has been written into the chat. Nancy's yeah. going for the gold. You control the Army Corps of Engineers because Congress controls the Army Corps of Engineers. And we control Congress because Congress works for us, the people. So as citizens, it's important to let your congressional members know that this river system is important to you and you expect them to be working on your behalf and taking care of it and fighting for it. Because people ask me all that time, what can I do? Who should I tell? And if we want to get changes made to how fl flow is controlled, then we have to get changes um, with the Army Corps of Engineer. And I won't spend a whole lot of time on that. I'll, I'll wait you know, for questions um, if those come up. OK, one or two more points. And I'm going to turn it over to Cam, who's going to talk about um, uh, river truck, which I'm excited about. So just to remember, so we have this very connected system. So the, if you tonight, if somebody asks you, well, what the heck did Georgia from Apalachicola Riverkeeper talk about? If there's one word that you remember, this is the one, C connectivity or connection or connect. It's connected. And if we talk about the river, we're talking about the bay. If we're talking about the river, we're talking about the basin. If we're talking about Florida, we got to look at what's going on with Georgia and Alabama because we've got this dynamic system and all these moving parts work together. Um, I won't jump into the, the too much of the challenges, but know that drought um, and decreased flush, uh, freshwater flow, ecologically speaking, is what has really trouble this river system for years. And a lot of that is related to decisions that are made about how the water's moved through the dams and down through the rivers. Um, I do want you to know that um, we've got oil and gas exploratory permits um, happening in the Apalachicola River Basin. I'm gonna encourage you to check out our website if you wanna get further updates on that. This is something that Apalachicola Riverkeeper has actively opposed for a variety of reasons. Um, and there's lots of, of information on our website there for you. And um, my favorite poet activist, Wendell Berry says, the earth is what we all have in common. And it's something that we have to take care of. And I know that um, you all understand that we've got to take care of it for generations to come. And if you want to stay connected to Riverkeeper, I would invite you to sign up uh, um, for emails on our website check out our social media sites. And of course, you're, if you wanna become a member, we welcome that as well. And I'm gonna turn it over to Cam and I'll wait. I, Cam, if it's okay with you, I think holding questions for both of us to the end, so that way you have your time and then we can circle back. That Sounds okay. good. Yeah, great, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, do I just go ahead and share mine? Uh, yeah, there you go. Is that away? All right. All right, can I hide these people? Um, Let's see. I just make your screen bigger, maybe it's easier for you. All right, to... I'm hiding also. Perfect. Hold on, that won't work. All right, do y'all see the people at the bottom? We see the people on the kayaks with Apple. Okay. Yep. Yeah. All right, well, very good. First of all, I wanna uh, thank you for inviting us uh, tonight uh, to talk about this. Uh, tomorrow's Earth Day, so it's a really uh, great time for Georgia and myself to be here to share um, this uh, information for you guys. So Apalachicola Riverkeeper, Saving an American Treasure. I'm going to be talking about River Trek and environmental stewardship. My uh, big um, saying is that the river is calling. 
I'm looking forward to doing the river trek for the third time. Hold on one second. My arrows don't work. So you may need to go down just to the left part of your PowerPoint and look around there, Cam, in the left, left hand part. Corner. Yeah, see if there's something in the left hand corner. Sorry for. Um, aha, okay, I haven't done this before. All right, here we go. So uh, George has already spoken about uh, some of the basics, so I'll skip uh, some of this. Uh, but I think the uh, understanding the connection with all of the rivers is really important. Um, so uh, beginning of the Jim Woodruff Dam, uh, and she said it's about 106 miles long. So very uh, special region uh, for lots of different reasons, but most importantly, the biodiversity. So I think a lot of you guys will re uh, recognize some of the places, some of the places that you've been and uh, shared time. Apalachicola, uh, CPO Creek, Owl Creek, Means Creek, Dog Island, St. George, St. Vincent, Dead Lakes, uh, Terea, Bluntstown, Bristol, and anywhere else along the river and bay, many of us have really deep connections. Um, and my life journey is full of a lot of uh, great times with family and friends, um, new and old. So it's uh, very, very meaningful to me. Um, protecting nature and its complex webs creates that good common foundation for us and gives us purpose. And this river really resonates with a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. So we've got lots of stories that are woven um, throughout our time and through our history uh, that really kind of nourishes our soul. So the connections and shared experiences uh, in this whole area help kind of give us that sense of place and that spirituality that really matters. So to each of us, it means a lot of different things. So protecting it um, is really powerful. Uh, it's really important that we continue this um, great effort to try to make a difference for the future. So River Trek is Apalachicola River Keepers annual awareness and fundraising campaign. It supports the outreach and the education and the advocacy efforts. This year in October, I'll be paddling my third river trek and I'm super proud to be a part uh, of this organization. Beautiful picture here from along the river. All right, so we'll be paddling about 106 miles plus or minus depending on our little excursions. And it takes about five days. We'll put in at Chattahoochee at the dam, just below the dam. And we will paddle all the way down to the uh, bridge down in Apalachicola. And so this is our annual Apalachicola River Trek. Uh, great group of people each year, lots of different personalities. People do it for lots of different reasons. I'm gonna share some of my reasons uh, for doing it. So we, um, we reach out to the community. We reach out to friends and family and businesses um, in our communities. And we try to raise the awareness and share about the importance of the river, why it matters. Uh, this past year, um, you can see our team there on the um, sandbar setting up camp and we've got some dinner going on over there on the right, but we met our uh, great goal of over $60,000. And so we're really contributing. So the generosity of people like you guys um, really does make a difference and it allows us to continue our efforts. This is just a neat picture of a uh, swim break cooling off so we'll paddle for a long while and then uh, pull over and have a little snack or get some lunch and stretch our legs and take a look at the map and see where we're gonna be heading for the rest of the day. Just a really incredible uh, experience. It's fun to look at everybody's uh, kayaks and all their gear that they uh, like to take with them. We average about 20 miles a day, uh, give or take, depending on weather and uh, things like that. And we do have some fun little side trips. Every night we uh, set up camp. Um, some people are super fast at getting those tents up and uh, they can go and fetch some firewood. And um, we have a nice little uh, community dinner. Uh, it's a great way to kind of kick back and relax and talk about the beauty of the river. Uh, along the way, we do talk with historians and local officials and naturalists and scientists uh, that really give us that uh, deeper 
understanding of what's going on with the river. So the river keeper does a great job of um, really enriching our experience while we're on the river. Here, the, um, here's Georgia and myself uh, cooking. Um, so we, uh, we do not go starving by any means and we have a whole lot of fun. So this past year, of course, COVID was um, in full swing. So you can see our masks there. I think it's important to understand why we paddle and uh, to get into the soul of some of us. Um, and so the power of the river and the bay is really the big draw. So the river itself is a treasure, as we know, and it nurtures uh, us and it heals us. So different people have different connections. It's a foundation of uh, quiet and wild wilderness for many. So being out there on the kayak, it's just incredibly peaceful. You can paddle by yourself or you can meet up and meet some new friends. Um, so it's interesting how it changes throughout the, uh, the days on whether you wanna be alone and taking it all in and having that spiritual moment, or if you wanna uh, be talking about um, whatever it is with your, with your paddling buddies. So there's peace, there's respite. And to me, the connection with the natural world. So really appreciating the biodiversity that we're paddling through uh, and understanding the connection with the uh, water uh, that we share with Alabama um, and Georgia. It really, it really sinks in when you're right there at the water level, you understand uh, how important it is to, to be aware and to do what we can to uh, be good stewards and to protect it. So the people that recognize its worth are really going above and beyond to try to continue it for many generations. Another part of my mission and my personal inspiration for wanting to do River Trek is for education and advocacy. So that's a big part of what River Trek is all about. I am a school teacher. I teach um, sixth grade science at McClay School. And this allows me to bring um, into my earth science curriculum a really um, real uh, uh, part of the curriculum for the students, talk about the real issues, talk about the ecosystem. Some of these students have never even uh, been over there. So once we start digging in, um, they understand what's in our backyard, why it's important uh, to take care of it. And it just fits perfectly. And the kids really, really soak it up. So they get exposed to um, what is uh, special about the river. A couple of things that we do um, in the classroom, we dig into a lot of the science behind what's happening. And so I applaud the Riverkeeper uh, and other organizations for um, having real-time information um, so that the kids can look at the science behind it and start to understand. You know, one of the things we do in science is basic graphing. So to look at something like this and understanding uh, what's happening uh, is really uh, a great learning tool because it is real. So charts and photos and maps are helping us understand the bigger issues. They think about public policy uh, even as sixth graders, they start to understand that they can have a real voice. We reach out to a lot of the local scientists um, that share their knowledge. Um, a lot of the river monitoring that goes on with the river keeper, the water quality reports. There's just a ton of stuff out there uh, for all of my students to uh, dig into. And it really uh, brings it to life for them. I love sharing it with my students. Um, this was actually one year when Mary Burr was teaching uh, fifth grade science. So we kind of tag teamed on uh, doing some of the uh, earth science together. So water quality is a big uh, topic for fifth and sixth grade science uh, and on into seventh and eighth grade for their life uh, and then physical science. So they're really trying to understand why it's important uh, to understand what sustainability is all about and why, it's, um, why, it, why it matters to get involved. So they sort of have a voice for the uh, first time. This is a paddle, picture of a paddle that they gave me that um, all the students signed and I've carried it for the last two river treks. So it's fun to carry my students along with me along the journey. This is a little setup. I took all my gear in uh, right before river trek the first time and showed the students, you know, what all I actually pack into the boat. And it really just inspires them to want to get out and get outdoors and know that they can do it uh, as well. So we're trying to protect that precious resource. The students dig in and they have a choice of um, what they wanna do their research on. Some of them uh, dig into the uh, tuplo trees and the honey um, that is there. This is a picture of some of the tuplos. 
uh, water wars, the uh, salinity, if there's too much salt or not enough salt, you know, the balance of uh, all of the water with the river and uh, the bay and the gulf. We talk about the creeks and the sloughs, the snakes and the birds and the amphibians and everything else. Um, they really enjoy it. Some of the work that they produced this past um, 2020 River Trek um, were really beautiful kind of infographic boards. Um, so they were able to choose um, their interests. And a couple of them were really interested in the trees and understanding how the detritus, all the leaves and uh, material, really when the floodplains um, get inundated, how all that um, organic material really helps out uh, everything from uh, the top of the river on down to the bay. We also look at um, geology. So I teach earth um, science. So this ties in nicely. It's a really beautiful river. If you've never been on it, I encourage you to come on some of our trips with um, River Trek and see some of the stuff up close. So there's really interesting features uh, in the limestone. You've got sinkholes and swallets and springs and caves, um, fossils uh, at Allen Bluff. I'll show you a picture of Allen Bluff in just a minute. So uh, the kids obviously love fossils and those big old shark's teeth that I'll show you next. So it's just a really uh, real bit of science for them. And most of them don't um, or haven't ever been out there to see it. So it really opens their eyes and they wanna go on trips uh, with their family and with their scout troops. Um, so it's quite fun. These are some pictures of some fossils right there at Allen Bluff, which is a beautiful area um, right near Bristol. Um, and you can see our kayaks pulled up there looking over across at Allen Bluff. This is a beautiful spot to camp. So really fascinating. So they dig in, I keep saying dig in. They talk about uh, the geology of the area. Here's a great picture. This is the highest um, natural exposure in Florida. It's beautiful. You can see all the layers there. This is uh, our good friend, uh, Ryan Means and his family. This is an example of one of the little side trips that we um, sometimes do uh, if uh, all the conditions are right. So you can see the limestone there, it's just beautiful. So if it had had rain, you know, these are adventures that not everybody gets to see. This is a very, very unique area. These are some of the caves and the gullies that have eroded away. Um, so you actually get to crawl through the uh, limestone there. Really interesting. So I think uh, if we think about Earth Day and stewardship and what we can do uh, and how you guys might be uh, able to get involved, I kind of summed it up this way. So you can build strong relationships that result in conservation action, you can encourage conservation practices, you can be an advocate for solutions on some of the things that are challenging our area and our waters, understand the value of conservation and stewardship, be proactive, uh, responsible living, make good choices, be a part of something important. That's one of the big reasons I wanted to be uh, a part of the Riverkeeper making the difference. Every day is Earth Day. Um, get out and explore and ultimately we're going to protect what we love. So a couple of things I want to make sure you're aware of. Uh, we have some opportunities for you to join uh, and these are all available and they're constantly updated on our website. And uh, the annual River Trek, you'll be hearing um, who the new members will be for this upcoming uh, River Trek in October. So that is our outreach and fundraising campaign. We have monthly eco educational hiking and kayak outings. Uh, and it'll tell you if it's um, real simple or if it's a more advanced uh, kayak. So depending on what you're looking for. Uh, I take Collins along, my daughter's uh, in eighth grade. She's gone on several of them. So it's just a beautiful way to really get to know uh, with a great group leader uh, to know our area. We also have some really great uh, cleanups and we remove a lot of trash. Here's a picture of uh, some of us at the, um, just below the dam at Chattahoochee. And it just feels good to get out, uh, meet new people that have common interests um, and uh, making a difference for our river. So in this case, we're really getting a lot of the plastics out before it, they start to go downstream for that next 106 miles. Uh, down to Apalachicola. So FSU students, we have some McClay students, um, but we'd love to have some of you guys come out uh, if you'd like to. I just wanna raise your awareness about this new um, ARC GIS story map. 
It's a project that was um, created with um, the Riverkeeper and FSU uh, Office of S Sustainability. So GIS is Geographic Information Systems, and it's really showing um, all the different things that are in this area. And it's basically putting pictures and maps and everything. It's layers of information uh, about trails, about hiking, about paddling, just a beautiful, beautiful project. I give um, a lot of credit to those folks uh, who made that happen. So check that out. We'll put a link uh, in, the, um, in there for you. Another thing I think is uh, interesting, if you'd like to learn more, there's some really beautiful short uh, ecology blogs about the river um, and about um, a lot of different topics. They're short, but they're really fun to watch and they're very uh, educational. I use these in my classroom and a lot of the things we're looking at is what, what kind of mistakes have we made? How can we learn um, how we can change things for the future? Um, and where, you know, what are some of the issues that we're facing? And they do it in just a beautiful way. Uh, so I think you might enjoy those. So that is the WFSU Public Media Ecology blog. One of the uh, places that I personally love along the river is um, Dead Lakes. And this is uh, near, right near Weewa Hitchka uh, and very famous for the Tupelo honey that comes from the Tupelo trees. The picture on the right is a, um, are the bees uh, and the beehives uh, that they would take out onto the river to try to collect um, from the uh, Tupelo, the o Ogeechee Tupelo blossoms. So a lot of cypress and uh, Tupelo um, stumps, very interesting area, really easy place to kayak. Um, you see lots of bird life, there's great fishing, just a really peaceful place to be. All right, so the things that draw us uh, to love our wild uh, North Florida are at risk and we need to do something about it if we can. So our job is to raise community awareness about the river uh, and the bay and this helps connect people. So the connections I've made uh, through the Riverkeeper are really near and dear to my heart. Uh, and I hope that you guys will think about um, coming and joining us for an outing so you can understand how special some of these folks are and how knowledgeable they are about our area. So it's really worth protecting. And uh, for me, River Trek has given me a bigger purpose. It's a great way to give back. Uh, teaching school is a wonderful way to make a difference. But uh, I know at St. John's, you guys are always looking for ways to help others to appreciate this beautiful um, earth that we have. So this is just one way that um, you can reach out and make a difference. So I encourage you guys to dig deep and think about how y'all can contribute in your own ways. But I've really found a deep spiritual connection with all of these people. Tomorrow is Earth Day, so April 22nd, and we are going to be having a cleanup. Uh, and you can email Doug at AppalachicalRiverkeeper.org, uh, and that's from 10 to noon. This picture right here on the right uh, is a great cleanup. It's really interesting to see what kind of treasures you find. Just never know what's going to be out there. But every little bit of trash that we can keep from going into the river uh, makes a difference for everything all the way down to the bay um, and everything that we're uh, that's alive down there. So our family word is ongoingness. Um, Keeping that river going for generations is really, really important. Uh, the special memories that we've shared as a family and uh, with friends, special occasions, um, hikes and paddles and growing up hiking at Terea, uh, everything is just, uh, it's just connected. And to understand that connectedness really uh, is made aware to me um, through the river keeper and uh, paddling the river trek. So. We're all called by the desire to leave our earth in better shape for the future generations, while at the same time inspiring the next generation. So I, um, I love what I do and I love, and I'm um, proud to be a part of it. So I just want y'all to know how much your efforts and your support really help uh, the Riverkeeper to continue on its mission to help uh, protecting the river and bay. So thank you, here's a um, link for our riverkeeper.org. A couple of photos that I uh, borrowed were from Doug Alderson, Harley Means, and the Riverkeeper. So thank you very much. Oops. I think Cam and I would be happy to hang out and answer some questions. And then as we wrap up, I have a, a really short, um, hopefully uplifting 
video to share with you. So lay it on us. Ask some tough stuff or tell us something that you love about the river. Tell us a story. Or Anybody got questions? Because uh, I've certainly got a few. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll throw out a question. So I'm a native Tennessean, so this is all new. This is a wonderful presentation, um, even though I've been in South Georgia for a little while. Um, so thank you. Th this, was, this was amazing. So um, I can't say enough because I've been going down to, to the coast a little and, and, and getting to know the lay of the land and, and hearing this. This has been very, very helpful. Um, so, but I do live in Georgia, so I'm intrigued to see what is the what's the nature of the relationship now um, over the water, and you know, particularly maybe after the last election cycle. I mean, uh, what what is um, yeah, because Georgia changed a lot <laughs> congressionally, um, and so what is? But even for even and and I don't mean that kind of bipartisanly, but even people in the same party, um, um what's the What's the conversation between Georgia and Florida? Politically, um, it's been challenging with all three of the governors of all three states in terms of coming to a consensus agreement. And we have a real bumpy history of having a near compact sign, ultimately a trans water boundary institution type governing entity is what many of us believe would, would fix this problem. Like take the, the politics, if you will, out of it because we do have changes in administration all the time. So if you get close to a solution and people's focus changes, it's just been a really bumpy road for 30 some years. Um, the dams were put in, the locks and dam systems were put in and through the 50s and the 60s. So it's been almost nearly that full time where we've had challenges particularly in, in Apalachicola with the changes in the flow, but with, with the drought. So that all being said, the good news is there are people that understand the need for the equitable sharing of the water. There are um, stakeholders groups that have worked on that. The challenge is, is getting you know, governors and congressional leaders to say, you know what, we're gonna get this solved together. It's been my experience uh, in, in, a, in the community um, organization world is that it's frequently hard to get people to give something up or the perception that they're going to be giving something up sometimes is difficult. And that's precisely what we've experienced um, with regard to, to uh, water control in the Apalachicola River. Um, and, and with the court case, it, it certainly made things more challenging. So I don't know if I totally answered the question. There, there's hope, Wallace, I guess would be my short answer. It can be solved and we do have some leadership. The key at the congressional level is getting some strong partnership between congressional leaders of the three states. And I will candidly tell you, we, we've struggled to find Georgia leaders that were, are like, yeah, we're gonna go to bat and get the Apalachicola River what it needs. Um, it can be done, but it's, it's a big lift. Um. Georgia, I have a question. I have a first cousin who's a retired farmer up near America's Georgia. And mm -hmm. one of the things that uh, we've read is part of the, the uh, degradation of the bay there was uh, brought about by Bob Sykes cut, as well as the over harvesting of the oysters. And so I think that is part of Georgia's argument that um, that it caused as much of the problem as say the, uh, the agricultural over pumping and the, and the droughts. Is that accurate or? So there's been a lot of misinformation about over harvesting and, I, and, and we, I'd invite you to, let's talk off, offline a little bit more, maybe separately. Um, there's also be, lots of, Oh, there was, you know, the oil spill and other things that related to that. And, and part of that was were the, related to the legal arguments that were made in the Florida versus Georgia case. And, and you know, Georgia brought in their own scientists and it went back and forth. I can with confidence tell you and share data with you that shows that there wasn't over harvesting happening after the BP oil spill. What we have seen is with the freshwater, with the increased salinity, 
and the drying up of the floodplain with the changes in the water flow, that there's a relationship there with the amount of life giving type nutrients that need to make it into the bay to create that estuary. Again, it's really complex dynamic system with a lot of variables. There is no silver bullet. Right. Closing Bob Sykes cut is something that people believe will fix things. Um, certainly when you disrupt a natural system, there are impacts. Bob Sykes cut's been there for about 80 years now. A feasibility study to look at what changes would be made could be helpful. Do I think it's a silver bullet based on what scientists tell me? Um, it's not a silver bullet. It could be absolutely helpful. There's also folks that think closing the, the canal over in Port St. Joe will change the flow from Wimico. So those are all parts of the potential problem, but we do know that there's been changes with the flow and what's making it down to the bay, which changes the salinity in the bay and, and has caused problems. So excellent question. Um, the good news is the ACF stakeholders group, um, which has representatives from all the states, there are some really active ag folks there. People in, in Georgia, particularly even the Columbus area, struggle with water too because they've been impacted yeah. by the dam system as well. So we've got we've got things in common, and that's what I think is important to focus on. I really appreciate that question. Sure, thank you. I don't know if you want to share anything about the SLU project or that for another day. Sure. Yeah, and and I was going to wrap up with a short with a real short video that I think you all will enjoy okay. seeing. Um, and and of course answering their questions. I know we're. We're at 7.52, I'm a, I'm a timekeeper. Um, I've got, I ask a question to Cameron. Yes. Before you show the video about the, so I, I took a seven year old on a river cleanup in Tennessee. I think I set myself back a few years on another river cleanup, Whitewater River and tires didn't go well on the canoe. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so what age, yeah, it seems like the kids are into this. Your daughter's certainly been into it. Wouldn't say good kind of starter age for that. Obviously not the five day track. Mm -hmm. yeah. But um, what's a, is there a, is there a even youth group? I mean, is there a chance to get your- Every time we have different folks out there, we have young ones. Um, and Collins has been tagging along with me for a long time. Um, I see mostly high school students and college students, um, but no one's too young to go out and help out. We use gloves and we use the picker uppers so you don't, you're not touching the nasty stuff. Um, Appalachian River Keeper has it all uh, pretty figured out, but it just it depends on your child, I guess. <laughs> but getting them involved and making them aware early is always good. And the last question: Who? How'd you get a Yeti cooler in that thing? In a kayak? <laughs> somebody on that. Somebody in your shot had a Yeti cooler, and then I kind of got. How did they? Get oh, that? It, it's really quite amazing what people bring. <laughs> oh, that might have been George's. We do have a support boat. Oh, okay, okay, that's what those never mind. They bring some things in. Uh huh. Perfect. Okay, you all have a video. That's so a good question. Stop asking questions. <laughs> Love it. So I, I wanted to wrap up with a. Um, we had a really, as, as Cameron has emphasized, you know, the water. We're all connected by water, and so whether it's folks in Alabama or Georgia or, or folks south of us or folks way east and west of us, we're all water connects us. And a project that um, FSU students did some years ago, they, um, uh, uh, um, Dr. Andy Opal. Um, is a communications and media professor. And he assigned his students, he wanted them to just like Cameron has done with their students, we're gonna learn about a river system, we're gonna have a ton of fun doing it. And I want you to get out there and because they're media students, they all went out and did these short videos and then they compiled it into this fabulous documentary, which you can find on our website. But I wanted to introduce you to Tommy Ward, who's one of my heroes. And I, I can tell you this, this is a little bit of a, I, I've watched this a bunch of times, but Tommy's family's been, um, work in the Apalachicola Bay for five or six generations. He's the real deal. And um, and Tommy's somebody that I go to to talk to a lot. Like, well, how's it going? What's happening? And But his, his passion and his connectivity and his very earnestness over why this place is special to him, whenever I'm feeling a little you know, caught up, I, I like to go visit with Tommy. And I wanted to introduce you to him. He, he runs 13 mile, um, 
uh, seafood in, in him and his family run that in Apalachicola. So here's Tommy talking about growing up and what this means to him. The oyster industry in Apalachicola Bay has uh, declined probably 80 to 90 percent. I have the 13 mile oyster house. I have a 13 mile retail market in town. I have a shrimp house, processing plant, ice house, shrimp boats, oyster boats, trucks. You know, we do a little bit from start to almost the end game, selling to the restaurants, seafood markets and things like that. It's a shame to see what's happening to this estuary. The oysters are built, you know, and they keep the, the bay pristine, in my opinion. But if you do away with the oyster, if you don't have the oyster, you have filter and keep the thing clean. You're going to go away with the fish, the shrimp, the crabs. The lack of fresh water has created the dilemma. Uh, predators have been coming in, killing off the oyster beds. Um, and then when you do get a new wild spat set, the predators kill them off as well. And that's the lack of fresh water. I used to have 40 or 50 people working for me, families, you know, that depended on an income to raise their kids. It's gone, you know. It's been tough to see you know, these people have to go find another work, hopefully. Um, uh, it was a good way of life for me, you know, and for them, right? I love, you know, I love the It's not good, you know. Uh, you know, So Tommy is the, the real deal there. Let, oh, let, me, let me stop my video. And he helps me remember. Sorry, I'm trying to uh, fix my screen there. He helps me remember why we do what we do. And because he's a granddaddy and I know his kids are on the boat all the time and Tommy has worked um, hard and cares and ha is one of the many people that have reminded me you take care of the Apalachicola Bay and it will take care of you helps me remember why particularly on Earth Day that our job is so our collective job is so important so I appreciate you all taking time to um, spend time with Cam and me tonight to understand why this place is so precious and we invite you to to also get connected and keep doing what you're doing thank you Thank you so much for letting us speak about the Riverkeeper. Y'all are amazing. Your work is outstanding. Um, I love that video that you finished with. I've been there and I've seen what Tommy does and it, it's pretty incredible when you get that close to it and you know how important it is in people's lives. Um, both of your presentations really were educational, enlightening and I think fundamentally inspiring about the river. So thank you so much for your time and your effort.
Appreciate you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, St. John's, for Thank allowing you. us into, into your- Thank you for being a teacher and bringing that to your classroom. Amen. You know, I'm a retired yes. teacher and I just think yes. that's awesome. I'm so I proud love, of you. I love what I do, but um, the kids really make it special for me. So it's nice help. to see them caring about what's coming next. Yeah, hopefully in the public schools as well. You know, all of our kids, we're both public school educators and, you know, we just respect what you do. And hopefully someone's out there doing what you do. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh, thank you. Thanks, everybody. It's no, worth no. it. Happy Earth And we're members of River Keeper. So that's what we need is involvement in River Keeper and helping out and supporting. So that's all I want to say. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you all for having us. It means a lot to me to be able to do this. Thank you so much. Blessings. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.